Ever since I was little, I've been curious about how things work. Now, most kids, when they get a new toy, they want to play with it. But I always just wanted to take it apart. But uh, so, you know, I think that might have made my parents mad, but they it signaled to them that I wanted to become a scientist, which I did. But I also had an event in high school happen to me that made me want to become a childhood cancer doctor. And that was when my good friend's younger brother, this young boy, Stephen Daniel Jeffries, was diagnosed with cancer. Now, Stephen died at the age of eight in 1975 in Columbia, Maryland, where I grew up, from a rare type of pediatric cancer. It was my first experience of what cancer can do to a person, what cancer can do to a family, to a community. And I've learned a lot since then. I've learned that, it, well, it took me 17 years of training to become a physician scientist, and in the 20 plus years I've been practicing and seeing patients, I've learned that there's actually reason for hope. There's reason for hope because research cures cancer. But we may need to rethink some of the things that we've been looking at in terms of developing. The other th let me explain. So acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL, is the most common type of cancer in children. And this graph shows you the survival or the percentage of life of patients based on their years since diagnosis. And in the year that I was Stephen's age, eight, 1968, the survival of patients with ALL was pretty bad. So 50% of patients, you can see from the dotted line, only made it two years. And only 10% of patients made it six years or more. But through the careful application of research, that is testing hypotheses, this might work better than what we're doing, rejecting things that didn't work and building on things that did work, we were able to double that long-term survival by the time I was 12. And we as a medical community continued to work on that. And by the time I turned 17, patients diagnosed that year had a remarkable 60% cure rate. We didn't stop there, however. Over the next several years and decades, we continued to try new things as a community, as scientists, as med medical specialists, until the year I turned 49, when 90% of patients were cured. That's the most recent year we have date, data for because we have to follow them out five to 10 years. So we think today, if you're diagnosed with standard risk acute lymphoblastic leukemia of children in childhood, you have a, over 95% survival. That's amazing. <laughs> so my lesson is to trust research. We trust science not only to figure out how things work, which I love to do, but also to make the world a better place, to save lives. But cancer remains the most common cause of death due to disease in children. So we need to have, have some more work to do. What do we do about patients with advanced cancer, like Kate, an 11-year-old who came to me with this PET scan? You can see the outline of her image and all the dark spots except where her bladder is, which collects the tracer. All the other spots are where her tumor spread. She had a metastatic sarcoma. This outcome for patients with metastatic solid tumors or other kinds of leukemias like acute myelogenous leukemia is still like ALL was in the 1960s. Again, the survival based on the years of diagnosis and the survival for all patients pretty much with advanced cancer falls somewhere in this shaded range in 2017. Why haven't we done better? Well, I submit to you that the strategy we've been using for developing drugs is somewhat flawed. So in order to figure out how to do better, we have to go back to the biology. How does cancer work? So we all know, you probably learned in your high school biology class, that the cell divides in two, and those two cells divide further and further until you get a mass of cancer. It's usually a clonal population, similar cells. And at some point, one of those cells breaks off and goes down the blood vessel or a lymph channel, and finds another organ, like the lung or liver, and starts dividing there, and that forms the metastasis, like we saw in Kate. And what we've done over the past several decades is take some of these tumor cells and grow them in a dish, or put them in a mouse, and test the drugs in the dish or the mouse. And then only use those that work in the dish or a mouse and try them in people. But we may be missing a lot with that simplistic view of the world. We actually know a lot more about cancer than that. So I did a keyword search of the word cancer in the world's medical literature, and I found that we've published over 3.5 million publications on cancer, and just 100, over 135,000 have been added 
this year alone. So we know a lot. Now, I haven't read them all, but I have tried to look at the literature to figure out what are some of the key features that we need to be looking at. What might explain why we haven't cured some of these other cancers? And I boiled it down to three key features. And the first one is illustrated in this diagram. So this is from a publication done by Lee Ding and then Elaine Martis, Rick Wilson, who were both at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, and 36 others published a few years ago. And they were able to genetically track individual cells, in this case in an acute myelogenous leukemia patient. You can see those cells on the left, and they were able to track how those cells did over time. And you can see in this particular patient that gray cell expanded to become the main dominant population in that person. And then over time, other cells appeared, the orange one, the pink one. And with chemotherapy, the, the composition changed. Most of those cells disappeared, but some of them remained and then expanded further. So later at relapse, most of the cells are either orange or the pink with some of the gray. Now, these are different cells that acquire mutations, either genetically or epigenetically, meaning changes in gene expression. So I like to think of that as either their hardware or their software has been corrupted from a normal cell. So this gives diversity or heterogeneity within tumors. So you don't have just all that white, all those white cells as you saw before. The second thing is that tumors are not just comprised of tumor cells. They actually have a lot of normal cells. Cancers partner with normal cells. They recruit them into their microenvironment, and they cajole them into doing things for them. Normal cells produce substances that help tumors grow, that help them resist therapy. This is an image from a microscope of a tumor in, in my research laboratory where we could stain the cells. You can see all the blue cancer cells, and then in there are brown cells and pink cells. Those are T cells of different types. They may be in there suppressing immunity, or they may be in there trying to fight off the cancer because T cells are a part of the immune system. But we also know there's a lot of other cells that are normal cells in a, in a tumor, macrophages, other myeloid cells, fibroblasts, that help feed the tumor. So when we put a cell in a dish and grow it, those aren't there. And the third thing was an experiment that just blew me away when I saw it. And this was done by Juan Masage in New York a few years ago. He stained a tumor green and a tumor red and implanted them on different sides of the mouse. And after a few days extracted, the tumors looked at them under the microscope, and each of them was a mixture of green and red. So different sites of tumors are collaborating. They're communicating. If one of those diversity corrupted cells gets it figures out how to make a better tumor, it can pass that information along to all the other sites. In modern day words, we'd probably call this collusion. <laughs> so that gives us a different uh, strategy, a different picture of cancer that I'm modeling for you now. Instead of just the two cells that are the same, we know every time a cell divides, they're slightly different. They acquire some corruption of their software or their hardware. They evolve, they change, and they continue to do that as they divide and divide. So you get a heterogeneous mass that some cells may respond to your treatment, but some may not. And we know that when these cells break off and go down that blood vessel, like we saw before, and go into a different organ, those cells start dividing in that other organ. And in that metastatic site, they're evolving, they're changing. So what's in that metastatic site is different from what's in that primary site, and probably different from all the other metastatic sites. And when we take one of those cells and put it in a dish and grow it, it continues to evolve. It's now adapting to growth in a dish, so it changes. It's no longer the same as what it was in that person. If we put it in a mouse, same thing, it's different. So when we're testing drugs in the dish or the mouse, without the presence of normal cells, without the collusion between different sites, we might be kidding ourselves and missing a lot. Now, these tumor cells, when they're this different, should be recognized by the immune system, which are these blue cells, these T cells, coming in from the vasculature that normally kill or destroy infected tissue or tissue that shouldn't be there, foreign tissue, that's what rejection of organs is, and they should be rejecting the tumor. And we see T cells in the slide, like I showed you, but they're not doing anything. They're inert, they're, to, they're put asleep, they're suppressed. And we now know why that is. We didn't understand this for many, many years, but it's those normal cells, in many cases, that are coming into the tumor, and they're producing substances, TGF-beta, IL-10, pdl one These are molecules that suppress the immune response and don't allow these T cells to reject the tumor. So we need to think about that. And then finally, the collusion I talked about. These tumor sites are exchanging information. They're not only trading tumor cells, those red and green cells, they're trading some of these normal cells that have been adapted or coerced 
to do the tumor's bidding. They're trading those, norm, those substances that are suppressing immunity. And it's a real big conspiracy against us. It, tumor, cancer, metastatic cancer is like an organism living within us, conspiring against us. So we need to think about these three features of cancer if we are going to make progress against advanced cancer. The corruption of the genetics, the diversity, the coercion of normal cells which aren't present in a dish, and the collusion between sites that are feeding each other and helping each other. So I challenge the medical community, whether you're in the pharmaceutical industry, a cancer scientist, whether you're an advocate who's raising money for projects and supporting research, which we thank you, ask yourselves, is what I'm doing or what I'm supporting addressing at least one, if not all three, of these features of cancer? Because these are gonna what, what's going to take us to the next level to cure advanced cancer. Corruption, coercion, and collusion. Definitely something CN CNN should be interested in. <laughs> now, what we're doing in my research laboratory at Nationwide Children's Hospital here in Columbus is we're injecting these tumors with live viruses. The viruses are attenuated, meaning they're crippled. They don't cause disease. They can still infect and kill some of those tumor cells. And we're combining these, and that, that tricks the cancer into thinking, in the immune system into thinking cancer is an infection and brings in all those T cells. And when we combine it with drugs that target some of those normal substances, those normal cells, we can lay the cancer bare and get some really good shrinkage results. And we're hoping to achieve the same sort of thing in people. But there's probably many other ways that we as a scientific community can think about how to address those three C's. As you can imagine, it takes time, as you saw, several decades to make real progress with ALL. And it takes money. So I thought I'd just check in with our national priorities since it was just Halloween. We spent over $8 billion with a B on Halloween candy, which is $3 billion more than the entire budget of the National Cancer Institute. And the National Cancer Institute is the largest funder, public funder, of cancer research in the world. We spent about half that amount on hot dogs each year and $0.8 billion on July 4th fireworks, which is four times the amount the National Cancer spends on children, only 4% of the National Cancer Institute's budget goes to children. I had the pr privilege of spending some time in Washington, D.C. at a candlelight vigil about two months ago. It was quite a moving experience. Not only were we paying tribute and in memory of those we'd lost, but we were trying to raise awareness about cancer research and about funding and these are people who know the power of research because these are people who know the story about ALL. Through research, we've been able to cure ALL cancer. Let's not stop until we cure all cancer. Thank you.